So that's it for introduction to the event. Now I'd like to just make some opening remarks to sort of set the stage for the rest of our speakers. So I don't know what happens when you hear the term e-waste. When I first learned of this term, I uh, pretty typically connected that term to some pretty horrifying pictures that I'd seen in the popular media. And so these are photos taken from articles from Smithsonian Magazine and Wired Magazine. Uh, and you can see this looks like a pretty unpleasant process. We've got um, burning going on. We've got what looks to be a, a terribly uncontrolled site with all kinds of waste. We've got a, a pretty provocative uh, headline here, the hellish e-waste graveyard where computers are mined for metal. I wish I could get away with titling a scientific paper like that, but we're not quite there yet. At any rate, this may be your perspective, your only perspective, on what informal e-waste recycling looks like. So perhaps you think this is um, the one and only sort of vision of what e-waste looks like. In fact, I can tell you that it does look like that. So here's a photo of a rice paddy in Northeast Thailand. You can look, it's this incredibly bucolic and peaceful scene um, looking out over this. But if you swivel 180 degrees around and take a photo, you're looking at an e-waste disposal site. So in fact, these sites do exist and they exist all around the world. But this is not the only face of informal e-waste recycling. So for example, this past summer, we spent time collecting data in Chile and found there there's actually a quite healthy repair culture. So we're not simply discarding of electronics, we're actually fixing them. Uh, so e-waste doesn't just look like burning in an open field, it can look like a workshop in a, a, a sort of informal market area. And it doesn't necessarily involve tremendous amounts of environmental contamination. So a lot of this work is actually done in workshops or people's homes where there's still potential for health impacts and environmental impacts, but it's not uh, acres and acres of pristine land being contaminated. So we need to recognize that what e-waste looks like is not the same, and you, you have to be aware that there are many different um, venues in which this recycling occurs. So a question for you, you might think for just a moment, if you had electronic waste that you wanted to get rid of, where would that waste go? Well, if you're living here in the United States, you've got a couple of options. Maybe you decide to make a donation. Maybe you donate your old electronics to a charitable organization. Maybe you've got a younger sibling or someone who would be more than happy to take a hand-me-down piece of electronics, so you give it as a gift. Maybe you're fortunate enough to live in an area where there's a formal e-waste recycling program where you can actually take this and drop it off and be confident it's gonna be processed correctly. Maybe you don't have that. Maybe you just put it in the trash. Uh, the municipal waste stream, or maybe in a misguided effort, you put it into conventional recycling where um, typically there's no means to handle this and it's unfortunately gonna go right back to the trash can. Maybe like me, you just don't wanna deal with it and you stuff it in your closet and forget about it. Uh, so we got lots of different ways that we can handle our e-waste. In fact, it turns out to be a pretty complicated life cycle. So if we look at us, uh, consumers, users, of course, we've purchased our electronics from uh, a retailer who got it from a manufacturer. When it's time for us to get rid of this electronic, um, maybe useful but obsolete electronics, we might put them in storage. Again, that's the closet scenario. Maybe we give them to a shop that actually fixes them up and resells them. Maybe we give them to a recycler who directly recycles it. Maybe we end up giving them to a collection agency who then takes it to a recycler. So those are all pretty straightforward avenues. The question is what happens after that? And we know that some electronic waste goes straight to the landfill. Some of it may be incinerated. Some of it may be exported to other countries. Some of it may be refurbished. Some of it may be recycled. Uh, in America, in uh, the United States, we're typically pretty insulated from these activities in the red circle. So we may not have any idea actually where are those things happening uh, with relation to my physical location. And it turns out, and it's probably not news to most of you in the room here, that the movement of e-waste is not just a local phenomenon. In fact, people have been studying for decades now the flow of e-waste, not just within a country, but across many, many countries in the world. And so I don't want to go into detail here, but you can see from the many, many lines interconnecting various countries and cities on this map, we have issues where e-waste is being potentially exported from some high-income countries, the US, the European Union, uh, um, Oceania to lower income countries. And with that comes economic opportunity, but with that comes some potential hazards that are quite substantial as well. 
So you might be asking, why are we having this workshop now? Well, uh, the fact is, and in fact, I think this graph uh, bears the story out quite simply, uh, we are creating more and more electronic waste year over year. And so if we zoom back to 2015 and then look ahead to 2021, uh, you can see we've got almost a tripling of the amount of e-waste that's being produced. So this is a huge flow of waste that we need to account for. But the other thing that we need to be aware of is this red line here is um, symbolic of how much money is tied up in the recycling of e-waste. So this is a huge industry. Again, there's economic opportunity here that's undeniable, particularly for people in low and middle income countries. So again, just to sort of calibrate us, uh, I think most of us probably think of our cell phones and maybe a computer when we think of electronic waste. But I want you to be aware that there are many, many types of electronic waste out there. And in fact, it turns out cell phones are a small fraction of a subset of uh, one category of electronic waste. So what is e-waste? It's everything from the lighting in your room to telecommunication devices, phones. LCD screens, CRT screens, uh, things like thermostats to control the temperature in your home or office. Uh, large equipment, so this might be a dishwasher, a washing machine, um, small equipment, your coffee maker. Anything that has electronics in it can ultimately become electronic waste. And as you can see, we are making huge amounts of this stuff every year. And the production of electronic waste or the creation of waste is not equally distributed around the world. So the graphic on the left here shows basically what fraction of global e-waste production is coming from each region around the world. And so you can see, for example, North America, we're not the leaders in terms of um, the production of electronic waste. In fact, that uh, distinction belongs to Asia and then Europe. Uh, so we're not producing the largest amount of uh, electronic waste. Overall, we're actually not even producing the largest amount when we look per person. So the graphic on the right here is showing how many kilograms of electronic waste per person is created each year in these regions around the globe. And you can see uh, Europe is basically leading the pack per person, followed very closely by Oceania. And in third place here is North America. Again, you can see that Latin America and Africa and Asia are all contributing a very small amount of e-waste relatively when we look per person, even though regionally they're producing um, a quite large fraction overall. So one question that I think is quite relevant and valid to ask is, well, why should we bother recycling this stuff? And probably those of you in the room here who are interested don't need to be told this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So it turns out that recycling materials is much, much less energy intensive, for one, than mining new materials out of the ground and, and smelting and forging them into the um, components we need. So it turns out rather than throwing aluminum away and mining new aluminum, if we recycle that aluminum, it's a 95% savings in energy. So this really is the sustainable way to go. And you can see um, for many of these metals, particularly it's just incredibly more efficient um, and sustainable to do this recycling. And in fact, just last week, there was a paper that appeared in press that was comparing the prices uh, or the costs, if you will, of, for example, um, mining out all the materials that you would need to create a cathode ray tube display, an old style TV, compared to recycling those materials from an existing CRT. And you can see here the cost for recycling in green is much, much lower than the cost for getting those materials materials new. So I'm very excited about these new types of research that are asking the question, well, exactly how much money are we saving when we do this recycling? Or on the flip side, exactly how much health are we preserving and promoting or how much environmental impact are we preventing by recycling? So we do need to recycle clearly, but we also need to recycle carefully. So you probably can't read much of the text on this table, and that's somewhat purposeful. Uh, what this is is um, uh, not even a complete or comprehensive, but basically a listing of different types of um, chemicals that are found in electronic waste. Some of these things you don't have to be uh, an environmental health professional to know are pretty bad for you. So PCBs, arsenic, cadmium, lead, those are all bad. We don't want any of this, any of those in the environment or in our bodies. On the flip side, electronic waste also contains copper and silver and other precious metals. So those are good things that if we recycle have real value. So we need to recycle, but we need to recycle in a way that we're not just releasing all these hazardous chemicals and um, uh, unfortunately uh, not maybe maximizing our uptake of the, the beneficial chemicals. 
So many of you probably think if you send your e-waste off to uh, a recycling company, it's going to go to a pristine factory like this. Um, all the workers in there are happy, healthy, um, well protected. They're taking a look at the e-waste. They're dismantling it. They're separating it into its components. They're recovering the metals. And it's all a, a nice, happy, clean process. So it can look like this, but unfortunately, it oftentimes look like this. So in the informal e-waste recycling sector, we don't have this nice clean flow. We have people maybe living in a subsistence manner, um, surrounded by the waste that they're recycling. We have people who are not recycling this stuff through a single factory. This e-waste is taking potentially a very torturous path, changing hands many times before it gets to a dismantler or ultimately gets recycled. We do see in the informal economy uh, that's indicated in gray on this figure, there are some interactions between the informal economy and the formal economy. Um, but a large part of the informal economy, unfortunately, may end up just as uncontrolled release of waste that can't otherwise be utilized. So, uh, so that's something we need to be aware of. I wanted to just give you uh, a couple of um, pictures of what informal e-waste recycling looks like around the world. Our presenters later this morning will also show you many pictures. Uh, the first step, regardless of what country you go to, is collecting this stuff. So finding friends, relatives, companies that you can collect uh, e-waste from then sorting it into different products. So here's a, a stack of TVs and computers. Here's a stack of uh, hundreds of house fans. Here's a stack of uh, various household electronics. Again, in Chile, we've actually seen that people will actually go to great lengths to repair electronics. Mm -hmm. sí. And so this person is uh, an electronic board that had been um, uh, unfortunately broken. In this case, this is good, he's repairing, but what he's soldering with is 40% lead by weight. So that's maybe not so good for his health. Uh, we can also think about it dismantling. Uh, so here's some workers in using some very rudimentary tools, and materials that get copper in this case, uh, inside them. Here's a little more formal, uh, very formal activity in Thailand, where we've got a group of people, uh, again, breaking apart different types of electronics. You can see this man in the lower right actually has some power tools, so this is not quite a million man. Otherwise, a pretty similar operation, even though it's 8,000 miles away from Ghana. Uh, here's a, a video of a worker in Chile who's quickly dismantling an old power who may think this is a delicate process. So he might do this 100 times a day, and you can see he knows exactly what he's doing in this television, and uh, is very well skilled at extracting those elements. But you can also see guys who are doing the safest activity. He's throwing the stuff. No, he's throwing the stuff. He's throwing the stuff. He's throwing the stuff. But again, the, the speed at which this recycling occurs is, I think, quite impressive. Unfortunately, oftentimes the workers are left with uh, e-waste that is um, contained in a rubber coating or a plastic coating, and so oftentimes what they'll resort to is burning. It's a very quick way to remove rubber or plastic or, or other coatings, as you can see, may result in some substantial environmental contamination. So this is a mixed waste landfill in uh, Thailand. Uh, here's another example of a more localized way of burning. But again, you can see there's some pretty unnatural colors in these flames. What's that actually emitting into the atmosphere? The end result, what people are looking for here, looks the same regardless of what country you're, you're going to. So whether it's Ghana, Chile, Thailand, um, China, South Asia, people are going for metals, in this case, copper. Uh, so they resell this, and that becomes a, a valuable source of income for them. So just one final comment that I want to make here, and then I'll, I'll introduce our next speaker. Uh, many of you may think, well, gosh, why don't we just move this all to the formal economy and we'll have uh, a, a great success here. Well, this was a very interesting figure actually uh, produced by the UN. So this is a comparison of formal on the top versus informal on the bottom e-waste recycling. And so what we're looking at is how much waste is getting generated, how much of it is actually getting captured and collected, how much of it is being captured when we break it down initially, how much is captured in the final processing, so really recovering those metals, and what's our net yield. So you can see in a formal recycling setting, we're often collecting maybe in a good system, uh, say 60% of all the e-waste created. 
We're doing mechanical shredding, which is not all that good at uh, extracting all the value from e-waste. The final processing, where we're using smelting and all sorts of sophisticated techniques, is really good at getting the metals out. And we're looking at a net yield of something like 14% of all the recoverable metals. That's for formal recycling. If we look at informal, we're looking at a much stronger collection network. Now maybe we're getting 80% instead of 60%. Um, when we do the pre-processing, we're taking these things apart by hand. We're also getting better capture there, we're not so good at the final processing stage. We're using some pretty crude techniques, but the estimate here is a 20% yield, so that's better than a formal economy. So I want us to think about informal recycling as an opportunity for us to improve, um, but it actually has some advantages over formal recycling that we need to acknowledge. So with that, I'm going to close by saying there's lots of other issues we're going to talk about today. We've got engineering strategies that could be employed. We've got socio-technical issues, models of sustainability. You know, we may ask, do these workers have the right tools for the job? Are the devices designed in the, the first place to be dismantled? Are we contaminating food sources at the same time? So with that, I think we uh, don't have time for questions because we got off to a, a couple minute late start. But uh, again, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, and with that, let me shift gears and I'm going to ask um, Kristen to come up and talk to us for a moment about diversity and inclusivity. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me okay? 